Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Welcome to session eight of our course uh, about the foremost theories of old. Today, we are talking about the ascetic nuns, so Kisa Gotami and others. Um, today, my presentation will be about five minutes longer than usual, so I think we should start right away. And as usual, we will start with the Namotasa and feel free to join me if you want to. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami So, as usual, I will share my screen and show you what we're doing today. Um, so, today we are talking about the aesthetic nun. So first of all, I want to show you, I want to give you a little overview on the ascetic practices in earlier and later sources. So how they evolved over time. And we're looking at the Pali tradition first. And when we have done that, we will look at the ascetic practices in comparative perspectives. So we will also take some Sanskrit, Tibetan and Chinese sources into account. And once we have a good overview over what the ascetic practices, the Dutangas are, um, we are going to look into the question, why are they or some of them so controversial for women? Why are they so controversial for Bhikkhunis? And that has to do with the wilderness rules that we've already looked at uh, in the session about Upalavanna and also with a Patimokka rule that is um, that is called Sangha Disesa 3. So a Sangha Disesa is a fairly serious rule in the Patimokka. In the Pali, this is Sangha Disesa 3. In other schools, it, ha like it has different numbers. Um, but this is a rule that has a very, very big impact on uh, monastic life, bhikkhuni life nowadays still. So it is probably the most controversial rule in the bhikkhuni Patimokka, apart from the Garu Dhammas, or the rules that are related to the Garudamas, the rules that are related to the Garudamas. So I think this is very important that in this course about a foremost theories, we look into this particular rule uh, and um, yeah, see what's going on there with that rule. Um, but first of all, let's look into all the foremost nuns that do ascetic practices. So in the Pali tradition, we only have one single nun in the list of foremost disciples who is doing an ascetic practice, and that is Kisa Gotami. In the Pali tradition, she is the foremost of the nuns who wear coarse robes. And Kisa Gotami, of course, her life story is very well known. She is the one, the mother whose son died, and uh, she asked the Buddha for medicine to revive the child. And the Buddha asked her to find sesame seeds from a household where nobody has died before. Uh, and she went and searched everywhere, but uh, finally she had to um, come to terms with the fact that death is everywhere. There's no family where nobody has ever died before, where, where, where people have never died before. So um, eventually she went back to the Buddha and ordained and became an Arahant. So she is, in all traditions, she is closely associated with the ascetic practices. In the Chinese version, the Akotara Agama version of this list, uh, there are many, many more nuns who are doing ascetic practices. And I'm going to uh, through this list fairly quickly because we've already looked at, uh, at it in our um, second session when we looked at all those lists in a lot of detail. So I think we can go through it um, a bit faster today. And in this Chinese list, um, we again have Kisa Gotami in the first place, and there it says she's the foremost of the nuns who undertake ascetic practices, the 11 restraints. 
So here in the Chinese version, she is the nun who undertakes all the ascetic practices, not only wearing coarse robes. And at the time when this uh, sutta was, um, th this list was compiled, this sutta was written, um, we see that there were 11 ascetic practices. Uh, and we are going to come back to that number uh, in a little bit, because um, uh, it's quite interesting that it mentions um, 11 restraints here. Then the next one, uh, the foremost of the nuns who are not ashamed of wearing rough robes is the nun called Uttara. So Uttara seems to be parallel to Kisa Gotemi's quality in Pali. So coarse robes and rough robes is probably the same thing. It's probably just a translation uh, variant. And then the foremost of those who are always in secluded quiet places instead of living among people is the nun called Abaya. Of those who beg for alms, even when physically ill, without choosing between rich and poor donors, is the nun called Visaka. Of those who sit alone in a single place, without moving at all, is the nun called Batapala. Of those who wander everywhere, begging for alms among a range of people, is the nun called Manohari. Of those who keep to the three main robes, never being separate from them, is the nun called Sudama. So I think most of the practices I've just mentioned are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, the practice about only having three robes is a very common practice and I will explain it in detail in just a minute once I've gone through this list. And uh, the foremost of those who always sit at the root of a tree with an unmoving mind is the nun called Lina. Of those who, are, who always live out in the open without caring for a cover is the nun called Shretua. Of those who delight in empty and secluded places, not in being among people, is the nun called Upachala. And of those who delight in empty, uh, of those who continually sit on a grass mat without even putting a cloth on it, is the nun called Vina. So this practice of sitting on a grass, grass mat is also something that I will come back to in a minute. And of those who wear rag robes and go to bed for for arms from houses in the proper order is the nun called Anupama. And among my ordained disciples, the foremost of those nuns who delight in staying in abandoned cemeteries is the nun called Uttama. So we see in the Chinese version of this list, we have a very large number of nuns who are doing ascetic practices. And there's also a very wide um, range of practices that can be undertaken and that fall under the the general umbrella term of, of ascetic practices. Um, so um, let's look at the ascetic practices in a little bit more detail. The ascetic practices are called Dutangas in Pali and they're called Dutagunas in Sanskrit. And um, we can see a very, very distinct development between the early sources and the later sources uh, with regard to these ascetic practices. So this is something I want to explore a little bit uh, now for the next few minutes. And uh, what I'm showing you here is a standard early passage from the Nikayas from the Pali tradition. The passage here is from the Samyutta Nikaya from the Kasapa Samyutta, Samyutta 16. And I have picked this particular one because we know that Maha Kasapa is uh, the foremost of the monks who undertake ascetic practices. So he should be the authority on ascetic practices in the Buddha's time. But this passage recurs over and over in all of the Nikayas, so I could just as well have picked uh, another source. And Kasapa here is talking to the Buddha and he describes uh, his practice. And he says, for a long time, Venerable Sir, I have been a forest dweller and have spoken in praise of forest dwelling. I've been an alms food eater and have spoken in praise of eating alms food. I've been a rag robe wearer and have spoken in praise of wearing rag robes. I've been a triple robe user and have spoken in praise of using the triple robe. I've been of few wishes and have spoken in praise of fewness of wishes. I've been content and have spoken in praise of contentment. I've been secluded and have spoken in praise of solitude. I've been aloof from society and have spoken in praise of aloofness from society. I've been energetic and have spoken in praise of arousing energy. So here, um, 
we see the situation in the early Sangha during the Buddha's lifetime. And what we see here is not so much a list of narrowly defined specific practices, but we see it's more a mindset that people had being a few wishes, being content, uh, being in solitude, aloof from society, energetic, and so on. Uh, and we see a few specific practices here, but even the practices that are mentioned here, forest dwelling, arms, food eating, regro wearing, triple robe using, and so on, they aren't uh, defined in so much detail. Like they, they, there isn't a list of criteria as in the later sources. In the later sources, uh, all of these practices um, um, have become a lot more narrow, a lot more specific, and um, there are certain criteria that, that people have to meet in order to qualify for uh, as somebody who undertakes those practices. And there are different grades of strictness in which uh, people can undertake those practices. But we see in the early times, it was really quite open, uh, a little bit fuzzy. Uh, it's not that, that much well-defined, for example, what a forest is, um, how far that has to be away from a village and whether people are living in, in a kuti in the forest or just under a tree or in a cave or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a general mindset and a few, um, a few practices um, that are fairly open and, and cover a fairly wide, um, wide range of, of possible practices under these umbrella terms here. And I think arms food eating is fairly self-explanatory. That means going on arms round. Um, and rag robe wearing means um, that you don't accept robes from lay people, ready-made robes or um, new cloth from lay people, but that you collect discarded cloth and you stitch it together and make a robe that way. And using the triple robe or using three robes, that means that um, usually monks and nuns um, we have three different ropes. One is the sarong, the lower rope, which is basically like a skirt. Uh, and then we have the upper rope, which is this one here. And then we have one called the sangati. Uh, if you have seen pictures or if you have met Theravada monastics, in formal occasions, you have seen that sometimes they wear this kind of long shawl on their shoulder. This is the sangati. This is a double rope, a double layered rope, extra thick. And in modern times, many monastics only use this for ceremonial purposes. We don't really properly wear this robe uh, in like our everyday life. But in the early times, it was obviously not just for, for ceremonial purposes. It was really a robe that was used uh, because it was double layered. It was very useful in winter for extra warmth. Or if you travel, you can um, use it kind of as a mat or as a blanket. Um, so definitely it was uh, something that was very useful to the Sangha. And if you are a triple robe user, you don't have any extra robes. You don't have spare robes. So that means if you want to wash your robes, you can wash one and you have to wear the other two, for example. So it's just a way to limit your cloth requisites. You don't have any other cloth requisites except for these three robes, no spare ones. So, Again, this is the early practice, and we know that in the very, very early times, so in the, the first few years of the Buddha's teaching, these weren't considered especially ascetic practices. This was just the standard that uh, everybody who joined the, the Sangha kept. And then over time, as the Sangha grew bigger and as it became more widely known, Buddhism became more widely known and they got more lay support, and also as, as more elderly or maybe sick people joined the Sangha, it was no longer possible for everybody to actually undertake these practices and to live in that way. And that's when like settled monasteries started to, um, to be built. And when these practices became special practices that were, on, that were only undertaken by certain monks and nuns. But we still see that in the, even nowadays, we still see that in the ordination ceremony, everybody who takes higher ordination, um, there is a passage in the ordination ceremony where, um, where the, the, um, the senior monastics who carry out the ceremony tell us that uh, we have to be able to commit to these practices. So we have to be able to live at the root of a tree, to wear rag robes, to eat by going on arms round and so on. And um, if we get extra things, if we like get proper kutis and so on, that's great, we can accept. 
Uh, but if we don't get that, then we, we need to commit to being content with only that much. So everybody who undergoes full ordination actually is still reminded of that early time um, when things were practiced in that way. And these practices were then developed over time into a much more rigid and much more narrow system of 13 practices. And these practices first were mentioned in a text called the Melinda Panha, uh, which is called the Questions of King Melinda. This is a para-canonical text. So a text uh, in the Burmese tradition, this text is still included in the, in the Tipitaka, um, the, the Pali Canon. In the Sinhala and the um, Thai tradition, this text is so late that it is no longer included in the Pali Canon. That's why it's called a paracanonical text. Um, so there the, the 13 practices are mentioned, but the, the, fully, um, the full explanations and the fully defined version with all the details is only found in a text called the Visuddhimaka. And the Visuddhimaka is a commentary written by a monk called Buddha Gosa in Sri Lanka, roughly 1000 years after the lifetime of the Buddha. So a very long time later. And this Visuddhimaka text uh, mentions and defines in much detail 13 practices. And uh, let's, I just want to quickly go through them. The refuse rag wearer's practice is the same as the rag robe wearing, I've just explained. Triple robe using, I've also just explained. Arms food eaters practice means going on arms round, so not accepting invitations to lay people's places uh, to eat or not accepting uh, food that is brought to the monastery by lay people. House to house seekers practice is a special form of arms round where like if you just do the arms food eaters practice, you can still um, go on arms round in any way you want. You can go to your friends, you can go to rich neighborhoods, you can go to houses where you know that um, people have especially nice food. But if you do the house to house seekers practice, that means you go to every single house on your route um, without making any distinctions. So without caring whether this is rich or poor or whether they have good quality food or whether people might be unfriendly and abuse you, you just go to every single house in, in order. So this is a more aesthetic form of doing arms round. And one session as practice means you eat only one meal per day. Um, so you have no extra breakfast or something. The bowl food eaters practice means you eat from your arms bowl. You don't have extra um, bowls or extra um, containers. So for example, if you have soup, you have to put it in there. If you have juice, you have to put it in there. If you have um, ice cream, you have to put everything together into the bowl. The later food refusers practice, it means that um, if, you, if you're eating and somebody has offered you more food and you've said, uh, no, you are satisfied, then you can't eat food again um, elsewhere. And uh, the forest dwellers practice is self-explanatory. I think it means living in the forest, not in a village or city. Tree root dwellers practice is also self-explanatory, means living under a tree. So as the forest dweller, you can still have a kuti in the forest. Or you can still have a cave or something. Tree, as a tree root dweller, you don't have a kuti. You just have the tree as the shelter. Open air dweller is even more aesthetic. You don't even have a tree. And then charnel ground dweller um, means that uh, you stay in a, what is called a charnel ground. So in, in the Buddha's time, people didn't bury the corpses. They uh, had a specific place outside the village, usually in some kind of forest area where they uh, put down the dead bodies and they just left them there to decompose and sometimes to be eaten by animals. So by going to such places and practicing there, um, monks and nuns could do some um, asupa practices, so practices of the unattractiveness of the, of the body. Um, and then any bad user's practice means that you're content with any um, kind of lodging or sleeping place that is assigned to you, and you're not trying to swap with others, you're not requesting any kind of special arrangement, uh, just whatever is given to you, whatever kuti or whatever bed is given to you, you stay there. And the sitters practice means that you practice uh, in three postures, walking, standing and sitting, but you don't ever lie down while you do this practice. So sometimes people just do that on the oppositor days for one night 
So they meditate throughout the night, they don't sleep. Uh, but there are also people who undertake this for some several months or even several years. Um, and then you obviously you have to sleep uh, sitting up, you can't lie down for sleeping. So these are the 13 practices in the Pali tradition, according to um, the evolved form that we find in the Visuddhimaka commentary. And um, now I want to briefly look at the other non-Pali traditions and compare these 13 practices with what we find there. Um, and I have included three sources. One is called the Mahavyupati, which is a Sanskrit Tibetan dictionary of Buddhist terms from the 8th and 9th century. The Dvada Sadhuta Sutra, which is a Chinese sutra. It was translated by Gunabhadra in the 5th century, but is of course, um, earlier than the fifth century, because obviously it has to exist already in order to be translated. And um, the Dharma Sangraha is a Sanskrit glossary of Buddhist technical terms, which is attributed to a monk called Nagarjuna, a very famous monk uh, around the second century CE. And each of these sources mentioned 12 ascetic practices. So um, if you recall in the beginning, when we looked at the list of the uh, foremost nuns in the various, for the various uh, ascetic practices, the first one uh, in the Chinese list was um, Kisa Gotami. And there it was said that she undertakes 11 ascetic practices. And um, obviously that must be an earlier form. Um, so, Probably it hadn't yet evolved into 12 practices. Um, and actually there are variant readings of that particular text that also mentioned 12 instead of 11. So probably at a later time when people saw the discrepancy, some of the sources adapted and switched to 12, whereas other sources kept the original text which mentioned 11. So we, we again see that there was a development over time in these ascetic practices. Um, and as I mentioned, these 12 ascetic practices are not exactly, they are similar to the Pali, but not exactly the same. So I have made this small table uh, to compare, to make it easy to compare. Uh, here in the Pali um, column, we have the exact same 13 as I've just mentioned. Then the Mahavirpati and the Dhamma Sangraha have the same practices. Uh, and I've put a Y if they have the practice, Y for yes. Uh, if they have the practice and I've left it blank, if they don't have the practice, that, that particular practice. And then the Chinese Vardasa Dutta Sutra is somewhat different from both uh, the Mahavirpati and the Dhamma Sangra and also the Pali. So uh, let's go through it quickly and have a look. So the first one, re wearing rag robes, is found in all traditions. And uh, that's to be expected, as I mentioned, this is, or, this is already included in our ordination ceremony. So it would be very weird if one of the traditions forgot about it or discarded it um, in any way. And triple robe using is also found in all traditions. Again, this is something that is well attested in the early sources. So something that uh, is to be expected that it's, it's quite popular and it's found in all the sources. Eating arms food is also found everywhere. This is also from our ordination ceremony. The house to house seekers practice is not found in the Sanskrit sources, but it is found in the Chinese sutta. The one session eating is again found everywhere. This is again something that is regularly mentioned in early sources. Eating from an arms bowl is only found in the Pali, interestingly, even though it is very clear that all monastics have arms bowls, um, so maybe, maybe uh, the other traditions didn't think that this was especially ascetic. Maybe for them, this was the normal thing to do. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure why this is only found in the Pali. The Chinese version has something that is similar, which is eating in moderation, which seems to be somewhat of a merger between bowl eating and later food refusing but it's not, it, it's not an exact match to either of the two practices. And later food refusing is found in the Mahavirpati and the Dhamma Sangraha. And then the ascetic practices that uh, are concerned with um, residences or lodgings, forest dwelling is of course, again, found in all traditions. It's, it's again, something that was very popular already in the early times. 
Tree root dwelling is found in our ordination ceremony, again, so to be expected to be found in all traditions. Open air dwelling is found everywhere and Chana ground dwelling is um, found everywhere. Any bed using is not found in the Chinese version. And that sitting practice is again found everywhere. And the Mahavirpati and the Dhammasangraha have a special practice that uh, is wearing felt robes, so wearing coarse robes. And it's very interesting that we see this in the Sanskrit source, but not in the Pali, because as we have seen, the Pali list of the foremost nuns has Kisa Gotami being the foremost nun of those who wear coarse robes. But even though this practice was is clearly attested that in, in the early sources, it did not develop into a particular Dutanga in the later Pali commentaries, but it did develop into a Dutanga in the Sanskrit text, this uh, wearing of felt robes. And the Chinese version has one extra Dutanga that is not having afternoon drinks, afternoon juice drinks. And uh, probably most people know that monastics are not supposed to eat afternoon after solar noon, so we only eat in the morning. But we can have certain kinds of drinks in the afternoon. But apparently the Chinese have this tutanga where you can't even have any kind of uh, drinks in the afternoon. So that is special only to the Chinese tradition. So um, now we see, uh, like with this comparison, we see that many of the practices are, are common to all of the Buddhist traditions. And with that in mind, I think now we are well prepared to uh, examine the question, how come that, um, um, that um, these ascet some of these ascetic practices, not all, but a, a good number of them have become so controversial for bhikkhunis. Um, and as we have seen in the early text, the, the, both the, the Chinese and the Pali sources, um, show um, Bikunis undertaking a wide range of these ascetic practices. We even see them undertaking ascetic practices that are not found in those lists, such as, for example, sitting on a grass mat without putting a, a cloth on it. Um, and we see in, in the Terigata, we see nuns undertaking these practices. We have seen um, in the course of, of the last few weeks, we have seen in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, um, we have read two suttas from the Bhikkhuni Samyutta uh, about um, Soma and about Upalavana. And we always saw um, that they are going into the wilderness, into the Andavana, the dark forest, and practice there in seclusion. So it, it's well attested across uh, all, like, all, all the various Buddhist schools that in the early sources, Bhikkhunis did undertake those practices. So why do the later sources say that some of these practices are not uh, suitable for bhikkhunis? And um, in order to understand why, uh, uh, I want to read with you a small passage from the Visuddhimagga, that is that commentary that was written in the Pali tradition 1,000 years after the, roughly 1,000 years after the Buddha's lifetime, which is a, a very uh, highly, um, highly esteemed um, um, text in the Theravada tradition and even in Mahayana countries, this text is sometimes referred to by the Mahayana monastics. So it's very, a very, very influential text. Um, and so let's read um, what this text says. So, so this text explains the, the ascetic practices in a lot of detail. And now towards the end of this chapter, there is some kind of um, small summary here. And it says, uh, with like the text is a little bit um, written written in a certain style, a little bit difficult to understand, but hopefully we can um, piece it apart and explain. So it says with thirteen for bhikkhus, so that means thir the thirteen ascetic practices, the thirteen dutangas for bhikkhus, and eight for bhikkhunis, twelve for novices, seven for female probationers, so that is sikamanas, and female novices, the samaneris and two for male and female lay followers. There are thus 42. So if you add 13 plus eight plus 12 and so on, then you come to 42. Um, so this text says uh, that Bikunis can only undertake eight. So we cannot undertake five of the 13. And the next passage explains why. 
If there is a charnel ground in the open that complies with the forest dwellers practice, one bhikkhu is able to put all the ascetic practices into effect simultaneously. But the two, namely the forest dwellers practice and the later food refusers practice are forbidden to bhikkhunis by training precept. And it is hard for them to observe three, namely the open air dwellers practice, the tree root dwellers practice and the charnel ground dwellers practice because a bhikkhuni is not allowed to live without a companion and it is hard to find a female companion with like desire for such a place. And even if available, she would not escape having to live in company. This being so, the purpose of cultivating the ascetic practice would scarcely be served. It is because they are reduced by five owing to this inability to make use of certain of them that they are to be understood as eight only for bhikkhunis. So here the text says that uh, bhikkhus can undertake all 13 at the same time. Um, if they find um, a lodging, a place to live that uh, meets the criteria of all the five uh, dutangas uh, that have to do with the lodging. So it has to be in the forest and under a tree and some at the same time somehow in the open and also on a charnel ground. And then uh, you can do all, as a bhikkhu, you can do all the ascetic practices at the same time. Uh, but for bhikkhunis, that's not the case. So two practices are supposedly uh, forbidden to bhikkhunis because they have a rule, uh, a training precept, a rule in their vinaya. The first one, the forest dwellers practice is, this is the rule about not living in the wilderness. So forest dwelling or wilderness dwelling is the same word in the Pali. It's just a different translation here. And we've already looked at the wilderness rules when we talked about Upalavanna. And we saw that these are later rules. They're in a part of the vineyard called the Kandakas. And we know that the Kandakas are a later text that evolved a, a certain amount of time after the Buddha's passing. But of course, by the time the Visuddhimagga was written, those texts were well established. Uh, the Kandakas uh, had existed for many, many centuries already. So the training precept uh, definitely is taken as authoritative. Um, so that's the reason why they can't undertake the forest dwellers practice. And then um, the later food refusers practice is very interesting. That's actually a very funny case. And I had to check this with three different bhikkhus in order to make sure that I'm not um, misunderstanding this. And um, the letter food refusers practice is a practice that says if you have like if you uh, if you ate at a lay house and they they offered you more food and you refused and you said no I've had enough um, then then you can't eat again unless you perform a certain a certain ceremony that is called the leftover food ceremony and then you can go back to the monastery and eat the leftover food there so that is the situation for monks. But for nuns, we have a different rule. Our rule is not the same as the one for the bhikkhus. Um, so for the nuns, we don't have this ceremony about making uh, food into leftover food. So for nuns, uh, we don't have the option to um, make food as, to, to declare food as leftover food. And for that reason, um, we are always keeping that Dutanga by default. If we are keeping our Patimokka rule, we are keeping this Dutanga anyway. For that reason, we cannot undertake it as a special practice. So the commentary claims that we cannot undertake this Dutanga. And it's, yes, we cannot call it a Dutanga, but all bhikkhunis who keep Vinaya actually keep this Dutanga anyway. So it's kind of a little bit uh, a funny way of, of, of phrasing this because bhikkhunis do keep the sutanga in, in actual, like in actual real life. And uh, that's again, something that we see in our Patimoka quite frequently that the Bikuni Patimoka in many ways is more ascetic uh, and more strict than the Bikuni Patimoka. So in, in here we see that Bikunis are keeping a Dutanga by default anyway. Uh, and then uh, the next three practices that Bikunis uh, supposedly cannot undertake are the open air dwellers practice, the tree root dwellers practice and the charnel ground dwellers practice. Um, because bhikkhunis are not, to, not allowed to live alone. Um, 
And yeah, the text explains it's difficult to find another Bikuni who wants to do this. And even if you have another Bikuni who wants to do this, then you're still in company, so you cannot practice in solitude. So it kind of defeats the purpose of going into the wilderness in the first place. So in order to understand what's going on here, um, we have to look at a rule that's called the Sangha Disesa 3. This is the rule that prevents bhikkhunis from being alone. Um, and um, so for uh, the remainder of the time today, we are going to look at Sangha Disesa 3 and its parallels and uh, explore um, what's happening with this rule. Because as you saw clearly in so many early sources, Bikunis did practice alone and they did go into the wilderness. So what, what is happening here in our Vinaya text? And uh, Sangha Tisesa is a fairly serious kind of rule. So this is a rule that even people who don't keep Vinaya strictly would, uh, you would usually make an effort to keep because clearing a Sangha Tisesa offense is very, very difficult. It takes a very long time. It takes several weeks. Uh, it's a huge burden, not only on yourself, but on the entire Sangha. Um, and it's very inconvenient for everyone. So this is something that monastics do take quite seriously. So having a rule that um, restricts the bhikkhunis in, in such a, a serious way and being in such a, um, a high class of, of offense is actually quite, uh, quite a difficult situation. And this is probably the rule that is, apart from the Garudamas, is, this is the rule that is the most controversial in the Bhikkhuni Vinaya. Uh, and, in, and this rule is interpreted in very different ways in different communities. I have heard of communities, monks communities, not monk communities, monks communities that interpret this rule in such a way that Bhikkhunis, even inside monasteries, Bhikkhunis cannot stay alone in a room even when they sleep, their beds have to be so close together that they can touch each other during the night. Um, so, like that really, that really, really um, inconveniences the Bikunis. You can never be alone. You can't even sleep alone inside a monastery. But I've never seen any nuns practicing in this way. I've only heard this interpretation put, for, for, put forward by the monks, by certain monks. Um, but I have stayed in communities where people, where, where uh, the nuns are not allowed to even go outside the gate of their monastery, even if the monastery is in a village or in a city. So if, even if it's not a forest monastery. Um, so they are, they are literally sort of trapped, imprisoned into, like inside their monastery, unless they have a companion to go out. So, and then of course there are other monasteries that have more, um, like less, less strict interpretations of this rule. Um, but it, it can have quite a huge impact on the nuns' lives. So um, let's look at the rule. Let's read the Pali version first. And the Pali version goes as follows. If a bikini walks in between villages alone or crosses a river alone or spends the night away alone or lags behind a group alone, that bikini has committed an immediate offense for which she is to be excluded, a Sangha di Sesa. So we see the rule has four factors in the Pali version. The first one is not walking in between villages alone, not crossing a river alone, not spending the night away, so outside the monastery alone, uh, or not lagging behind a group alone when you're outside the monastery. Um, in the reasonable interpretation of this rule, you can inter interpret all these factors much more strictly. Um, also, what I've translated here in between villages, this is my translation, and I think this is the correct way to, to read this rule. Um, but there are differences of opinion. Some people uh, translate this as going to the village alone. So that means even if you are, if your monastery is inside a village, you cannot go outside the gate of your monastery because that would be going to the village. Um, but uh, it's, uh, the Pali word is gam antara. So gama means village, and antara. Is, means in between, so in in or it can be read in different ways, but this is a, a very straightforward kind of translation, and I think it makes a lot of sense because if we look at the early times in India, we know um, it was uh, much less um, densely populated than it is now, 
there were very uh, dense jungles in between villages and villages were like miles and miles apart. And in those jungles, there were like wild animals and there were like bandits and criminals. And of course it, it would have been quite difficult or quite dangerous for a woman alone to walk there. Even as a group, it might have still be somewhat dangerous. So to me, the, the dangerous part is the, the stretch in between villages, not the village itself where there are lots of people. Um, so that is the Pali version of this rule. And uh, now let's look at the Dhammaguptaka. The Dhammaguptaka is a close sister school to the Pali. And this rule goes as follows. If a bhikkhuni crosses water alone, enters a village alone, spends the night alone or walks behind alone, that bhikkhuni commits an immediate offense that should be given up as Sangha di Sesa. So the Dhammaguptaka um, has the same sort of same or similar four factors as the Pali crossing water and spending the night alone, walking behind alone. But the Dhammaguptaka version specifically says entering a village. So it's not clear if you, like from the rule itself, as it is phrased, uh, that could still mean you have to go out from one village and enter another village, or in a strict interpretation, it could be read as like just stepping outside your monastery door. Um, and the Dharma Guptaka is that vinaya which is uh, still practiced nowadays by, with, uh, by the Mahayana tradition, the Mahayana bhikshunis. And of course, as we know, the Theravada bhikshuni order, bhikkhuni order was revived by, by the Dharma Guptaka bhikshunis. And uh, a lot of the early Theravada nuns got training from the Mahayana bhikshunis. So uh, we have the way many people nowadays interpret um, Theravada Vinaya is a sort of influenced by the Dharma Guptaka tradition. So this is also one reason why some people tend to interpret this rule much more strictly than might be necessary. Um, but generally the Dharma Guptaka has four very similar factors to the Pali. And the search school here, the Mahishasaka, is also a very close sister school to the Pali and to the Dharma Guptaka. And this rule says, if a bhikkhuni wanders alone, stays overnight alone, crosses water alone, legs behind on a path alone with the part attachment for a man, unless there is a reason that Bhikkhuni commits an immediate, immediate Sangha di Sesa from which one can repent. So again, we see four factors, wandering alone, staying overnight alone, crossing water alone, or lagging behind on a path. Um, so four, again, four very similar factors to uh, the other two schools uh, with the additional qualification of uh, that uh, the nun has to have a depart mind, depart mind, uh, depart attachment, so um, a sensual desire in her mind. Um, if she lags behind on a path, so if she separates from her group. Um, so here we see it's not so much the, for the protection of the nun from being raped or, or being attacked, but it's sort of to protect her from her own mind because she might have um, sexual desire here. Um, so we see there are some variances, but in general, it's sort of the four same factors uh, within these uh, three sister schools. Now we are looking at a school that is somewhat uh, more removed from these schools, which is the Sarvastivada school. Uh, so this is not, this school is not quite as closely related to the others. And here in the Sarvastivada, this is uh, the Sangha di Sesa 6. And uh, it goes as follows. It's significantly different and goes as follows. If a bhikkhuni spends the night alone, even just one night, that act constitutes an immediate Sangha di Sesa, which is remediable. If a bhikkhuni goes to lay houses alone, whether at night or during the day, that act constitutes an immediate Sangha di Sesa, which is remediable. If a bhikkhuni goes to other villages alone, whether at night or during the day, she commits an immediate Sangha di Sesa, which is remediable. And if a bhikkhuni crosses a river and spends the night alone on the other bank, whether at night or during the day, whether in a different village or in a different territory, that act constitutes an immediate Sangha di Sesa, which is remediable. So what we see here is that, again, we see four factors of the rule, but it's not quite exactly the same factors. So they again have the, the factor of spending the night alone, the factor of going to another village, 
and the factor of uh, crossing a river. But crossing a river again is then qualified uh, with the additional requirement that the bhikkhuni needs to spend the night alone on the other bank in order to break the rule. And the fourth factor is not lagging behind a group. The fourth factor is going to lay houses alone, which is significantly different from lagging behind a group. And we also see that um, even though the rule is, is supposed to be one rule, so there's only one number assigned to it, Sangha is a sixth, like only sixth, um, the rule is broken up into four parts, and it seems like it should be four different rules. Um, but still, they're still combined under, under the heading of Sangha di Sesa 6. Um, and then the Savasivada has a very close sister school, which is called the Mula Savasivada. And in the Mula Savasivada, that split has been completed. So in the Mula Savasivada, these are Sangha di Sesa 6, 7, 8, and 9. So the rule has broken into um, four parts here. And it says, if a bhikkhuni stays overnight alone in another place away from the bhikkhuni monastery, it is a Sangha di Sesa. If a bhikkhuni leaves the bhikkhuni monastery and goes to lay houses alone during daytime, it is a Sangha di Sesa. If a bhikkhuni walks on a path alone, it is a Sangha di Sesa. And if a bhikkhuni swims across a river alone, it is a Sangha di Sesa. So again, we see four factors that are somewhat similar to its sister school, the Sava Sivada. Um, so we again see this factor about going to lay houses. We don't see the, the factor about going, uh, about lagging behind a group. Um, and it's similar, but at the same time, it's a little bit different. It doesn't have this, uh, uh, this uh, additional qualification about spending the night alone on the other bank. It mentions swimming. Uh, it mentions um, walking on a path instead of going to other villages. So we see even between close sister schools, there's quite a good amount of variance. Um, and again, it is broken into four different parts. <coughs> and um, now we are looking at the last school that I want to show you today, which is called the Mahasangika school. The Mahasangika school is the school that broke off from the other schools first, that is the most removed from the other schools in terms of school development. And uh, this is interesting, the Mahas, in the Mahasangika is also broken up into three parts, not four. And these are five, their Sangha Tisisa is five, six, and nine. So here the rules are not even kept in an order. So in the Mahasangika tradition, these uh, rules don't even seem to have belonged together. And also in formal, for formal reasons, uh, we can see that five and six are very close together, but nine is somewhat uh, more different uh, from them, from the other two. So um, yeah, let's read this version. And it goes, if a bhikkhuni walks without a bhikkhuni companion, she may not leave the village territory except at a suitable time. This is a suitable time if it is involuntary or if she's sick. This is called a suitable time. This is an immediate Sangha di Sesa offense. If a bhikkhuni spends a night away from other bhikkhunis except at a suitable time, this is a suitable time if she is sick or if criminals cause trouble around the city, this is called a suitable time. It is an immediate Sangha di Sesa offense. And now number nine is if a bhikkhuni crosses a river alone at a ferry crossing place, it is an immediate Sangha di Sesa offense. So we see here the, uh, the number five and number six are fairly close, also on formal grounds with this additional so um, insert here about suitable times, um, which we don't find in any other tradition. Um, but number nine doesn't have this extra thing about um, suitable times, um, but instead it has this extra uh, qualification about uh, crossing at a ferry crossing place. Um, and we see this rule only has, like this, this tradition, the Mahasangika tradition only has three different factors, not four. And these three are walking um, outside the village territory, spending the night away and crossing a river. So these are the factors that we have seen in all the other traditions already. Uh, but the other traditions have added a fourth factor, uh, but not the same fourth factor. So in some schools that are closely related, it is lagging behind a group. 
And in other schools that are closely related, um, it is uh, going to lay houses. Um, and so we see the situation is quite confusing. Um, and that's very, very unusual for a rule that is um, such a severe rule as a Sangha di Sesa. So usually, even though the Bikuni Patimoka is not as well preserved as the Bikku Patimoka, the serious rules, um, for the serious rules, the parallel situation is usually much, much closer than this. This is the only uh, serious rule which is so confusing which has broken into several parts in some schools where different things are added to it in different schools where we're not even sure if this is one rule or three rules or four rules. Um, so what we're seeing here is that there seems to be a common core that must stem from the period of time before Buddhism broke into different schools. But clearly the rule wasn't properly fixed yet at that time. So the rule was still undergoing many changes. And every school then evolved this rule into, it, into its own direction. So that really points us to the fact that this rule um, underwent a lot of changes at a later time, and also that it didn't exist at a very early time, because otherwise it would have been fixed already at a time when Buddhism split into different schools, but clearly it wasn't fixed. So that shows us, um, I think this is a very, very strong indication that this is not an early rule. And also when we, when we compare it to the other early sources, the Terigata, the lists of foremost nuns, we can see that um, in the Buddha's time, nuns did not practice in this way. Nuns did not have these restrictions about not being able to be alone. So I think uh, this rule is a very, very doubtful rule. It's very likely doesn't originate from the Buddha's time. Um, so in the Buddha's time, bhikkhunis did undertake um, ascetic practices and it seems that they enjoyed them because we have this long list of uh, ascetic nuns in the Chinese version. And we have, again, in the Terigata, many nuns who rejoice in their practice of uh, doing these kind of things, uh, living, uh, living in the wilderness, living alone there. Um, and of course, that is very important for practice. If you cannot be in solitude, then it's very difficult to develop higher stages of meditation. Um, so, yeah, um, to recap what, we, uh, what I wanted to show today, I wanted to, to celebrate the practice of the early bhikkhunis that did undertake the, um, the ascetic practices without restrictions, and then um, show you how, how restrictions were put into place again over time um, to restrict the freedom of movement for bhikkhunis, uh, also to restrict their ability or to practice. And I think those restrictions are quite doubtful. And if we have, if we have to live with those um, rules in modern times, I think it's very important that we find uh, ways of dealing with them and ways of interpreting them that uh, honor the spirit of the early bhikkhunis and um, don't obstruct women from practicing the Buddhist path properly. So um, with uh, this much, I think uh, I would like to end my presentation for today. And if you have any questions or comments, then um, feel free to ask or to type them in the chat if you're not comfortable to speak. Um, yeah. So, are there any questions? Vanessa, yes. Please go ahead. Hi. Can Hi. you hear? I'm on my phone, so I don't know if this is working. Yeah, it's working. We can um, hear you. Okay, good. Uh, and sorry, I came in a little, little bit late. No problem. Um, you are an amazing lawyer. <laughs> You were just lay it out. It's so well done. You just laid out your case step by step by step to get us to this conclusion, which I think was brilliant. Um, the whole time I was listening to you and looking at this rule more carefully, I was struck again by an argument I remember reading years ago that the Vinaya um, and maybe the Buddha and the early male monastic Sangha acts like the Bhikkhuni's husband. 
that that would explain the role, the garudharmas, the extra rules that the bhikkhunis have to, that, that the only way that the Buddha is going to accept them into the fold is if he takes on the role, the role of their protector, because women always had a man protecting them in ancient India. So either it was the husband or it was the father, or eventually it's the son, which is an old saying, it's one of the three. And so when they leave the home, the Buddha becomes the new man in the women's lives who then acts as their guardian. And this breakdown of these rules is definitely very claustrophobic as an independent woman like me, with, I, to, and to hear some of your descriptions of having to sleep next to each other, like the, some of these interpretations are kind of definitely claustrophobic and they feel like husbandly rules of an ancient time. Mm -hmm right? You may not go here. You may never be alone here. Like, cause you're under my guardianship. Right. So there's, it's just a, something I wanted to bring up as a way of thinking about why, why these rules may have been put out there because the concept of an independent woman wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what to make of that, but it's, it's really striking to see these rules being played out that way. Mm. Yeah. So I agree with that. Um, Tracy, one minute. Um, uh, so in, in some ways, definitely, I agree with that. But I really think that we have so many sources in the early times that show us that the rule wasn't in place there or that it was interpreted very, very, very differently from what we find nowadays. Uh, that I think, I, I really think this again shows us how the development um, um, evolved over, over several centuries uh, during the Buddha's lifetime and then after the Buddha's lifetime. And that uh, I, I think the early bhikkhunis were a lot more independent than we give them credit for usually. And that it was decades or centuries after that the situation got a lot more difficult. And again, because Sangha is, is in such a confusing state, I think that shows us that the rule um, wasn't properly fixed yet at the time when when um, the schools broke apart, and that shows us that the rule must have been somewhat late. I I, th I mean that's my conclusion. Um, I guess people can disagree with me, but I think it's a reasonable conclusion. No, I think you make a really good case. And mm -hmm. so then, if the Buddha was not taking on that role, then you're looking at later men not mm -hmm. being comfortable with women having that kind of independence and mm -hmm. trying to pull them back into their wifely relationship yeah right? yeah which definitely. is very disturbing because the whole point of renunciation is to let go of all of those roles and then you see the community trying to put it back on the women so definitely yeah. it's, it's very disturbed like it's disturbing but it's also disturbing for a good number of monks because monks also are trying to get away from this responsibility for for family so that they, there's a, a large number of, of monks who really don't want to have this responsibility to look after other people or, look, or to be actually to be that closely involved with the bhikkhunis. Some of the, some of the monks are quite happy to, to, to be away from, from close, relationship, close relationships uh, with women. So I think that rule is actually doing everybody a, um, um, a disfavor. So yeah, yeah, it's, uh, of course, it's, it's a power game. So for, for monks who inter or for, for people who are interested in power, it's, it's, um, it's a way of controlling others. But for monks who are interested in, in renunciation, this really isn't all that attractive uh, to, to impose these kind of rules on others. So yeah, it just shows that, you know, the Sangha was a very diverse group and not everybody was enlightened, I think, at that time. Yeah. So Tracy, I think you had a question. Yeah, sorry for yeah. being so eager. Um, I really appreciate all of this discussion. Um, one of the things that I found really inspiring um, in an earlier session was when you're talking about how um, there's evidence that um, there are already plenty of women ascetics before um, Buddhism and that, and that was sort of like a, like the early nuns were a um, continuation of um, practices in other sects. Um, and I feel like in like the communities that I'm in, people often had this narrative that like the Buddha was the first to like allow women to practice in this way. And I wonder, um, and what you, what you lay out makes a lot of sense to me. And I wonder, are there um, other sources to read or like, 
like things to, I don't know, is there further reading I could do about like the um, the early wandering sex that included women or um, mm. I'm just like looking for more. Cause I, I feel like people haven't heard about this and it makes so much sense, but. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very strange because when you read the Pali Canon, you encounter all these other women from, you know, other non-Buddhist traditions and some of them, they're quite outspoken and there's one uh, that uh, is called Suchi Muki, uh, which means needle mouth, and she challenges uh, Sariputta to a debate and, and yeah, like uh, it's, it's quite obvious in the Pali Canon that there was a thriving um, religious life going on outside the Buddhist, with the, the Buddhist Sangha also that included women. Um, I'm not sure what to recommend about further reading. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Vanessa, maybe you have an idea. Yeah. Um, hi, Tracy. I can't see you because for some reason I can only see very little on this phone. But um, the, the tradition that we have evidence of, of having a thriving female community, uh, contemporary with the Buddha and even potentially earlier than the Buddha, is Jainism. Mm, and yeah. so there are a couple, there's not that much research being done on Jainism. It's a very small religion still today. Uh, and there's not that much scholarship or that much writing on it. Um, but there's a couple of books that give you kind of intros to Jainism. And then there's one book in particular that looks at women and a lot of the rules that were established in Jainism that are almost identical with the rules that were established in the early Buddhist community. And it's called Gender and Salvation. Uh, and it's by uh, the kind of, he was like the foremost scholar. He just died. His name is, J his last name is Jaini, J-A-I-N-I. -I. Um, so I would definitely recommend that book. And he looks at some of that early Jain female community. We don't know as much about it as we do about the early Buddhist nuns because the focus wasn't on the nuns of the Buddhist, the, the Jain community, but we do know they were there and they preceded the Buddhists. So mm. That's like the, the best material that we have. And there were probably wandering mendicants and wandering religious teachers that did all kinds of things. But that, I think that book is probably what's going to get you the closest to describing a competing tradition. And for a lot of scholars, we think that um, the Buddhist female monastic community was built on the model of the Jains, that the Buddhists were not the first. Um, and we have... And as Aya has said, we've had like, we have Bada Kundalakesa, who was a Jain nun before she became a Buddhist nun. So the sources tell us that as well. So that's where I would definitely go looking. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add next time we are talking about Bada Kundalakesa. So we are going to look into that in a little bit more detail. Um, her story and a little bit about her Jane past also. But I think, yeah, of course, that book must be, obviously, must be going in, in, a, in a lot more detail because we don't have that much time. And uh, in the suttas also, it mentions um, female Brahmin practitioners. It also mentions female Ajivakas, so Ajivikas. Um, and it, there are, I think, two or three suttas that um, go into a little bit more detail about wanderers female wanderers that are not aligned with any tradition, so they seem to be just independent wanderers. There's even one sutta about um, a whole family of wanderers, so um, uh, like a uh, husband and wife going forth together and then staying, also staying together uh, while they are practicing the ascetic life. So there is quite a bit more in the suttas than we normally um, give them credit for. Yes, Cindy. Um, hi, how are you? Hi. Thank you for, for the talk and the course. Yes, um, I look forward to every um, Monday night to learn a lot of things. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, so all the different schools that you, you mentioned there, like, are they all, like, existing now? Um, um, are they now or are some of them already sort of died away and they're not being... Um, no one in there anymore. Mm. So tradition says that originally Buddhism broke into 18 schools, um, which is a rough number, like it's, it's an approximate number. It's probably not exactly 18, but we 
for the Bikuni Vinaya, we have texts only from um, seven schools. And of those seven schools, um, only, well, depending on how you count, two or three are surviving. So of course the Pali tradition has been revived. Um, uh, the Pali Theravada Bikuni Sangha in, and then the Mahayana Dhammaguptaka um, Vinaya with the Dhammaguptaka Bikshunis has um, always existed, so they never died out. And then uh, we have the Mula Sarvastivada, which is the, the Vinaya tradition that the Tibetan monastics practice with. But in that tradition, they only have male monks. They don't have bhikkhunis yet. Hopefully at some point, uh, they'll be able to establish a bhikkhuni sangha there as well. They are, people are trying to establish, but also there's a lot of opposition in the sangha, in the Tibetan sangha, uh, against bhikkhuni ordination in their, their Mula Savastivada tradition. So depending on how you count, we either have two or three living traditions and the other schools have died out. We only have the text of those schools. Yeah, Sabamita has put into the chat that there's an interesting phrase in the Mahishasakal rule, unless there is a reason. Yes, so some of the rules have, um, have exceptions. Um, like in, all in most of the traditions, the rules have some exceptions, but the exceptions are also quite narrow. So you can't use the exception to just abolish the rule altogether. But yeah, the Mahishasaka has included that um, phrase into their rule. Uh, but the other schools don't have it in their rule, but in the um, explanatory material, the Vibanga, we can also see that they have uh, a, a number of exceptions. Okay, are there any more questions? If there are no more questions, then I think we can finish for today. And as usual, we will finish with three sadhus. Feel free to join me if you want to. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And see you all next time.